It's not working out. Okay, so um, just to echo previous speakers, thanks to the organisers for putting this together at short notice. Um, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, I'm looking forward to all the questions that we'll no doubt get at the end as well. Um, so my um, input is going to be about how I've used um, quizzes to deliver a course online for the past two years now. Um, so I have a bit of experience with this um, from non-COVID times. Um, so in preparing this, I got to thinking about what I was doing um, this time two years ago. I was on a um, lovely long weekend in Vienna, enjoying the Rose Garden. Um, but in the back of my mind was the fact that I had to design a new course. So I've been asked to develop a new 20 credit course for our incoming students. Um, this was going to be covering the sort of content that you'd see in SQA Advanced Higher Maths or in Further Maths A Level. Um, and that's aimed at really students who hadn't had the chance to do that at school or would benefit from some extra practice during semester one. Um, so the goal is to have this course ready by September and the steer was that it was going to be delivered online. So even though, though these were on-campus students, um, we hoped that this course would be scalable um, so that it could go potentially beyond our own kind of School of Math students to the wider university as just a sort of university maths experience that they might choose. Um, and I should also say that this was a, a joint effort, so it was me and Richard Gratwick, who was a university teacher in the school at the time. Um, so as well as the two of us, and we had, we're fortunate to have lots of input from our colleagues as well. So thank you to all of them. Um, the course ended up being called Fundamentals of Algebra and Calculus. Um, and it has 10 weekly topics, so five loosely algebra and five on calculus. And we decided to alternate between those each week. And what I want to focus on in this session is the, the way that we've organised the content in those, those sections. So here, for example, is a, a typical one of those sections. So week three on polynomials and rational functions. Um, this is in our local installation of Moodle. Um, and the course is delivered as a series of quizzes in the Moodle, um, Moodle VLE. So we have these quizzes at the top here, which are the, the main way that we deliver content in the course. And the ones at the bottom are the assessments for the week. So there's a whole story I could go into about how we do the weekly assessments and how that all works. Um, but for today, I'm gonna to focus on the top section. Um, so how we organize the, the material that the students work through and what they engage with in the course. Um, so we have this consistent structure each week where there's getting started and then four sections of content. And those sections we're thinking of as equivalent to a lecture and the associated practice that they would do. So we tell students at the start of semester, each of those sections should be taking you about two hours to work through. So that's our sort of clear expectation. And we do encourage them to plan their timetable because they're going to need to schedule this uh, time to work independently. Just dipping inside one of those sections then, so this is what one of uh, these sections of content will look like. Um, just zooming in on what's up there on the left hand side, this is broken down further into sections. So um, the students can see all the questions that are there um, and also the subheadings. So there may be like uh, subheadings that you'd have in a chapter of lecture notes. Um, and I guess what you're also noticing in this section, we've got some written exposition. So it's not just a, a quiz in the sense that here are some questions for you to answer. This really is the way that we're delivering the whole course. So there's no lecture notes or anything. It's just what they see in these set of quizzes. So we have all the expository content. We have short video clips of worked examples. And again, there's a whole story into how we um, went into recording those. That's maybe a story for another day. Um, and also mixed in with all of this is a lot of problems for the students to work through and get practice with. So the, the general organizing idea here is putting the textbook in the quiz. Um, so this is something that I was discussing a lot with Chris Sanguin here in Edinburgh. Um, and we've just um, published a, a preprint. So this will be appearing hopefully in a journal somewhere soon, um, but it's available for you to read online now if you wish. And that goes into the philosophy of um, this idea of putting the textbook inside the quiz and what are some of the possible implications of it. Um, I should also mention that the questions that are appearing there are written quite often using Stack, so the, the Stack assessment tool. Um, so here's an example of a question from this section. 
the student being asked to factorize a polynomial. Um, and there's again so much that we could say about stack, but um, just to give you the very quick whistle stop tour, if you, you're not familiar with it, I think the main features are that we can randomize this. So we can use a computer algebra system behind the scenes to come up with different polynomials to get them to factorize. From the student's point of view, when they type in their answer, they get immediate validation feedback. So if they miss out a bracket or something, um, in other systems that would count as a wrong answer. Here they can't even submit it until they, they're at least providing some sort of well-formed expression of the, that can then be judged. Um, so that massively cuts down frustrations that students have about typing in their answers. And also we have robust features for grading afterwards. So we have the computer algebra system maxima behind the scenes so we can take the student's answer and check various properties of it. And in that sense, the sky's the limit um, in terms of how much effort you want to put into giving tailored feedback to mistakes that you might detect. So I want to share with you three strategies that we use um, for adding in content to these quizzes. So there's lots of different ideas that you might have for how to put questions in to guide students' activity. These are just three ideas that I find myself regularly returning to. So the first is the idea of a faded worked example. So this happens quite a lot. Oh, could, could I just interrupt for a second there? Sure. Um, there's, there's a number of comments in the chat about um, a sort of like a high pitch sound in the background. Is that your oh. laptop fan or a computer fan of some sort? Possibly. Um, give me a second so I can demonstrate. Uh, I have an external microphone. I saw this mentioned in the chat. But because I'm on a Surface Pro, it's only got one USB plug. I was using that for a mouse. But let me switch over and use my external USB mic. <laughs> yes, that's better, isn't it? I think people are going to... Right. Okay. People are saying, thank you. That's so much better. <laughs> I thought, oh, it'll be all right. It's only background noise. But yeah, plenty of people were saying... Um, Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, thank you for interrupting. Oh, hang on, back again. Hmm. I'll let you. I'll let you carry on. As I, I don't think there's much we can do about it now that you've swapped the microphones. So. I think it was just that I plugged the microphone in, but it wasn't working. Is that working now? Yeah. So I just had to switch over to say use that other microphone. Okay. Sorry about that. This is me now on the blue ice. <laughs> um, okay, so faded worked examples. Um, quite often we'll have a procedure that we want students to get good at doing. So we'll give a, a worked example of that. And then you might, um, might then want to proceed to the student just solving problems for themselves. Um, but instead, the idea of a faded worked example is to give them some sort of intermediate step. So. The next thing that we would do instead is give them another example that's partially worked out and they need to fill in the final step. And then we might go to another example with a lot of scaffolding, um, even more for them to fill out. And depending on how complicated the procedure is, we'll maybe do a couple more goes of that. But eventually we get to a point where the student is solving the whole problem for themselves. So that's the idea of a faded worked example. It's quite easy to construct once you've got the template of one of the questions, you just produce some variants of it. Um, and this came from a series of studies that were, were done into this technique, which found that structuring the practice in this way helps the students to learn how to do this procedure more effectively. Um, so we do try to use that quite a lot in the course for these key procedures. The second idea that I return to a lot is um, getting students to construct examples. So this is an example of a question where the students are to give an example of a quadratic that has a certain number of intersections with y equals x squared. Um, and next to this, there's an applet where they could vary the coefficients and see the effect of that on the graph. Um, the idea here is to try and get the students um, working at a sort of higher level. So not just taking things that I give them and working with them, exploring their own example space and uh, what can they construct out of that. Um, and a third idea that I often use in the quizzes is opportunities to promote retrieval practice. So there's a 
a really consistent set of findings in cognitive science um, about the benefits of testing for learning. So the, the idea essentially that um, through retrieving information from memory, um, you learn better. So it's better to prompt students to do this act of retrieval rather than have them restudy the same information. That's something known as the testing effect. So being tested on something does help you to learn it. So where I use that in the course, um, quite often in the, the sections where we're starting a new topic, it's a chance to get them to recall things from earlier. So when introducing integration, it's quite natural to say, here are all these derivatives that we were doing a few weeks ago. Rather than just present that to the students as a table, this is an opportunity to get them to engage in retrieval practice. So here's a question where they were to give what they think were the most important derivatives that they, they learned a couple of weeks ago. And using stack, of course, we can assess each of the rows and decide, does the thing that they give in the left column match with the derivative that they've given on the right? And we can also suggest some sort of overall feedback. So maybe they've given a reasonable set of examples, but we can always throw in some other ones that they missed. Now, that's just scratching the surface. Obviously, to fill out the whole course, you, you need lots of these ideas. Um, just to briefly mention a few, um, I do like multiple choice questions. So after introducing a, a concept, a new concept, then throwing in some very simple comprehension questions in the form of multiple choice, I think is a good idea. Um, you can embed all sorts of things in these quizzes. So this is an example of a, a matching exercise where the students were to drag around the graphs of cubics so that they, they fit in the right place. Um, and my course doesn't really have a lot of proofs in it, but for proof-based courses, we're starting to expand into that. And this is an example from a paper that um, Chris Sanguin has been writing with Robbie Bickerton, who's been writing a lot of stat questions for us. And um, they've been working on a first year proof course. And they're, they're getting students to kind of fill in gaps in proofs and ask, uh, answer questions about their comprehension of proofs that they've read. So there are ways to do this using automated assessment. Um, so now I also just wanted to share kind of where, where things are going next. So if you do want to read more about the course, um, check out my website. So the paper that I mentioned with Chris is there. There's also a short paper that I've written that goes into the technical details behind those different strategies I was uh, explaining to you. Um, and just recently with Richard, we've written up an evaluation of the course. So this is based on some interviews with students and also some data. So looking at the, the students who took our course versus the students who did not, but were also doing first year maths. Um, our students were at a disadvantage at the start. So on our test of um, incoming kind of high school maths ability in our diagnostic test, they were about 15 percentage points below um, the rest of the class. Um, but after taking the course, they were at the same level. So I think there's some evidence here that this approach is effective. Um, where we're going next with this, so uh, jointly with Igor in Auckland and Chris in Edinburgh, um, I've just secured some funding from the Universitas 21 network, and both our institutions are part of that. Um, and what this is going to provide is a central stack server where we can share resources and colleagues who are not able to set that, that up locally in time will potentially be able to use that to deliver their teaching. Um, we're going to be running a program of training workshops, more on that to follow. Um, and we're also looking to coordinate um, the production of content. So what we're looking to base this on is the set of Helm workbooks, which are well tried and tested um, and hosted at Loughborough University. Um, so working with, with partners, the aim is to take these workbooks, which have the form of um, here's a note, here's a, a worked example, here's a problem for you to do across all the different topics that you might want to do for engineering maths. Um, we want to take that and turn it into a series of these fact style quizzes. Um, so if you would be interested in being part of that, um, joining this sort of partnership where we would divide up these workbooks and then share them by September, um, please get in touch with Chris Sanguin. Um, he's going to coordinate who's on board for all of this. Um, and finally, just to point out that we have a, a demo site available now where you can sign up and try out using Stack. Um, on there, you will find a link to upcoming workshops. So we're going to start running them in a couple of weeks' time um, to enable you to get started with, with using Stack. Um, and also further down the page, you'll see a list of available courses. So the workshops are there for you to self-enroll. 
You can also self-enroll in one week of the, the course that I was just talking about. So there's a whole week there that you can try out as a student. Um, and just to finish up, this was from also from my camera roll just from this weekend um, at the Modern Art Gallery um, near my house in Edinburgh. So it says everything is going to be all right. <laughs> Um, although actually I think one of the lights is out and it says everything is going to be a light. So I hope that's, <laughs> I hope they get around and fix their lights. <laughs> right, well, thank you very much. Um, give a clap there. Right, okay, so um, as you can tell, we had some technical problems there. I, I hadn't realised that I hadn't spotlighted you, so the, the camera was on uh, Katie for quite a while there, but mm -hmm. as her camera is off, I think it's going to be um, just, just blackness on the on the uh, on the video uh, in that little tiny corner um, so if anybody notices that then do, do send me a, uh, a notice I, I wasn't monitoring chat enough there um, and also it's a good good idea to check check the sound I think that the, the noise was probably too high pitched for me that I could hear it a little a little bit but uh, it was a bit right so now if we go to Q&A I've changed the settings so now you should hopefully, attendees, everybody should be able to see the questions and you should be able to upvote them. And the first question that seems to be getting lots of upvotes is how much more flexible is stack than e.g. numbers? Now, this, this, is, um, <laughs> this is gonna be a big argument, isn't it, between uh, stack and numbers. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether I should answer that, uh, ask you this. Um, I'm just waiting to see if another question pops up. We will be doing numbers tomorrow morning, so, you know, um, Christian will be able to have a comeback. So, um, I don't know, perhaps you could tell us, I mean, how well do you know numbers? Not all that well. So, I mean, I've looked at a few numbers questions. And I've obviously been to some talks where I've heard the behind the scenes described, but I've not really written questions in numbers to be able to authoritatively say one is easier than the other. Right, well, can I, can I start with a really awkward question? What do you think numbers does better? Is it, what's mm -hmm. the weakness in stack? And I'll, I'll, I'll um, remind me to ask uh, Christian a similar question. Yeah, so I think the, the clear thing is that with numbers, um, it's more easily deployed remotely, I think, and it's maybe easier to get up and running, is my understanding of it. So it runs purely in the browser, so you can you know, easily, quite, quite easily get up and running, whereas with Stack, you do need to have a server set up. Um, okay, right, good, thanks. Well, okay, we, 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 I, I should have... Uh, I should have got rid of that one there, shouldn't I? Because um, now we've started to get th things coming up here. So this stack system, this is from, uh, oops, answer live. This stack system looks really good. Can it be used by individuals or does it need uni buy-in? Yeah, I think you would need some sort of university systems working here. So in our institution, we use Blackboard, uh, Blackboard Learn. Um, so the stack question type lives within Moodle. And so that's a, a problem except that you can easily hook these things together. So we just got our IT people to set up a link from Blackboard that speaks to the middle server, which we run within the School of Maths. Um, and from the student's point of view, they log into my course and learn, they just click a link and it takes them through and they're in just to the stack quizzes. Um, so they don't need to worry about logins and things. And okay. on the other way around, the grades come back through into to Blackboard. So. If you get your IT people on board, then they can set that up so that it's kind of seamless um, across different platforms. Right, okay, thanks. Um, the, the, there is um, a question by John Mayer about, uh, could you please send a link to the paper by Chris Sanguin related to filling in the blanks in proofs? Um, could somebody put that in the chat, uh, Rachel or Michael, if you, you, can, you know what that is? Uh, Chris has just responded to that and there's a link in the chat to that paper. Okay. Great, good. Right, uh, so, we, so we, we, can, we can get that one out of the way. So uh, another uh, anonymous attendee, is it, possible to, is it possible to create a question in stack that grades line by line working rather than just the final answer? Um, yes, so Chris has been working on that feature over the past few years. Um, I've not used it an awful lot, um, but it is definitely possible. So you can, there's kind of two ways of working where the student says, you know, there's this line which is equal to this line, which is equal to this line, and Stack can check that indeed those equalities are true all the way through. Um, there's the other way of working, which is they're maybe working on a sort of if and only if, where they, they're taking an equation and then maybe squaring both sides and then doing something else to it. And again, Stack can check that those mathematical expressions are equivalent. 
Um, so that, that feature is there. Um, I think it's quite a, a newish feature, so I'm not aware of a huge amount of people having used it. Um, but I know Chris has used it to, to some extent in his first year proof course um, for, for kind of short chunks. Right, okay. Um, so we can get, get rid of that one. Just, somebody wants to know where you can get stack. You should be able, should be able to find that uh, on online um, by going to the Edinburgh site, I guess. Just stack Edinburgh should be. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's the, the demo site. So that would be the place to look. Yeah, best place to look. So, um, oops, keep forgetting to uh, answer them live. So uh, let's add some. We've got a question here from Jeremy Leversley. Have you got an alignment of what you specifically want to test in terms of levels of attainment, Bloom's taxonomy, and what you can do in this framework? Um, uh, yeah, so there's obviously some things that stack is not suited to doing. So automatic assessment can only take you so far. Um, for this course, I think that was fine. Um, it's quite a method based course. And so in a lot of ways, it's a kind of perfect marriage there that we want the students to get good at these procedures. Stack is quite capable of checking if they have, um, if we were doing a kind of more proof based course, I know that, you know, Chris is already using stack to do some parts of it. So the proof comprehension type questions can be used there to get at some of what you want, but still you're ultimately going to want students to be writing out proofs and mathematical arguments that will, will need to be human checked. Um, but there, because we're, I think that would fit within this model. Um, if you have some amount of human marking available, um, you know, I, I didn't in this course because I wanted it to scale. I should have mentioned that I had 110 students first year, 180 this past year. Um, with just me lecturing it essentially and me and Richard in the first year. So we weren't going to be human marking a lot of stuff. Um, that was why we went heavily on getting the automated assessment ready up front. Um, but if you did have time for marking, then you can use the Moodle quiz. You can put in questions where the students type in their answer or upload a photo and you can go through and mark them afterwards. So there is a way of mixing those if you want to test things that you can't do automatically. Okay, I'm, I'm, I've been been trying to uh, go through the the questions. It, it seems as though uh, Chris Sanguin is, is is answering a lot of them uh, <laughs> as we go along. I'm not quite sure how we're going to record all this. I don't know how Q and A is is recorded, but um, there is there is another question here that's been uh, voted up. Uh, it's about the faded examples. Um, uh, so it says thank you for the idea of faded examples. Is this more effective for procedural rather than conceptual understanding? Um, I mean, certainly what I've seen written about it, it's designed for sort of training in these procedural techniques. So I'm not sure what it would look like for something conceptual. Um, certainly in that direction, the example that I showed of when I was talking about proof, let's see if I can go back. Um, so that's something towards a faded proof construction that, that Chris has been thinking about. So if you want students to get good at doing a proof by induction, maybe you show them a proof by induction, then you show them one where there's bits for them to fill in, then you show them one where there's more bits for them to fill in, and then eventually they write one up that you mark by hand, potentially. Um, but I'm not sure about other kind of conceptual things that you might be thinking about. Right, okay. Okay, so um, I, I think that worked a little bit better for questions and answers. So uh, um, thanks very, I'm seeing some nods. So thanks very much to, to George for that great little talk there. And I'll 